Hello and welcome to another episode of Mean Brews. Today we're covering Black IPA, but before we get into the data, remember you can pick up this all grain kit um, from Bacchus and Barleycorn. Uh, links will be in the description of the video. Let's get right into the data. I found 22 Black IPA recipes. We had two that were best to show. Um, seven gold, nine silver, three bronze, and one that was award-winning. The BJCP style is 21B, a beer with a dryness, hop-forward balance, and flavor characteristic of an American IPA, only dark in color, but without strongly roasted or burnt flavors. That's key. The flavor of darker malts is gentle and supportive, not a major flavor component. Drinkability is a key characteristic. These were wildly popular in the late 2000s and uh, have kind of dropped off the radar, but they're kind of making a comeback now. When I looked at this style, the evolution was just off the charts. The black IPA you're used to uh, from the past is not what's winning nowadays, and I will, I will guide you through how this is evolving. But what's also interesting is we have very little variation between recipes. You might wonder what that means. Basically, they're going up or down in the same trend. So little variation as they move and evolve together. Um, looking at the original gravity, pretty much within the BJCP range, the average was 1.069. Um, however, I will be at 1.075, and the reason is we're seeing an increase in original gravity. So this beer is getting bigger with time. From the early 2010s to today, we've gone up quite a few points here. Um, IBUs anywhere from 50 to 170. Um, the mean was right above in their high, high part of the range here. Uh, at 85, I will be at 110. Um, and that's mainly to, to keep the BUGU balance. Um, SRMs anywhere between 28 and 49 with an average of 38.5. And I will be a little high in at 40. And the reason, again, is we're seeing this get, become a darker colored beer uh, in time from about 36 SRM to above 40. For the uh, average roast bills, or roast, uh, I'm sorry, average malt bills uh, for this style, um, about the average was about 82% of base malts, um, followed by roast malts, 7.5%, um, crystal malts, 6.5%, adjuncts, 22 and a little bit of recipes used, toasted malts, 1.5%. Looking at when they use those malts, um, the base malts were anywhere between 62 and about 94 percent of the grist. Um, I will be a little bit high um, from the average, just, just just a little bit higher than the average, not a, not a noticeable amount. Uh, when I zoom in on the specialty malts, 100% um, of the recipes use roasted malts, um, anywhere between 5 and 17 percent of the grist. Big ranges here for all of these. Um, where I'm going to be in my recipes, I'm going to be a little bit high, about 8.2% 8, 8 roast malts, a little low on the crystal, uh, I think around 5% of crystal, and a little low on the adjuncts. I'm not going to use any uh, toasted malts here. Um, for the base malts that were used for this style, the most prominent was um, two-row pale malt at about, let's see, 78% of the recipes used two-row at an average of 78% of the grist, but that was ranged between about 55 and 95%. Um, a lot of other people use some of these others, Marisada, Rye, Munich, Pilsner, and Wheat Malts, but not in a big enough proportion to, to put it into my recipe. I will be right at about 82% base malt, just right there with the mean that we showed before. Um, crystal malts, uh, two most prominent are uh, medium crystal, 36% of the recipes use a medium crystal at an average of 5.8% of the grist. And dark crystal, we had 32% of the recipes use dark crystal at an average of 3.4% of the grist. I'll be using both of those at right around 4% each. Toasted malts, we had just a, a few, probably three recipes use uh, toasted malts and they used aromatic or special roast. Um, pretty big, one recipe used, I think, 24% aromatic. Do not recommend that. Surprised that that meddled, actually. Roast malts, uh, most prominent is a chocolate or a carafa or a carafa special. I lumped them all together, 
anywhere between about 2% and 17% with an average of, let's see, 6.2% of the grist. 68% um, of the recipes used a chocolate malt. The next one's kind of surprising. Um, midnight wheat, 41% uh, of the recipes used a midnight wheat, which is a, a chocolate wheat malt, and an average of 5% of the grist. I'll be using at uh, right around four each um, chocolate uh, malt from Bryce and Min Midnight Wheat. Uh, others that were used were pale chocolate, um, black malt, black prunes, and roasted barley, but not in a high enough proportion here. Adjuncts, not a single adjunct um, was used to, to really pull it in, but when you look at them, the summation of all the adjuncts used, I am going to use something to lighten up the uh, the mouthfeel because this this is a big beer, so I'm going to use dextrose um, right at about three percent uh, of of the grist, just to lighten it up a bit. Um, we are seeing an evolution in time over the percentages of crystal used and the percentages of adjunct used. I'm using again three percent of um, of the grist as adjunct, right along there, and crystal I'm also using around that same amount of the crystal malts. Bittering hops, we had 16 different bittering hops used, um, mostly American, did have some Magnum um, show up here. Um, CTZ was the most common, 41%, uh, Cascade and Warrior, these are both very common high alpha acid, um, um, actually Magnum as well, high alpha acid hops. I will be using CTZ, and we're seeing uh, a prominence of CTZ used as a bittering hop, just increase with time with the Pearsons of 0.51, and less and less Cascade being used as a bittering hop. It just doesn't have the alpha acid uh, percentages to, you end up with more hop matter in your in your kettle with, with Cascade. Flavor hops, we had 10 flavor hops used, Cascade, Chinook, Centennial, and some others. Um, I will be using Cascade and Chinook uh, for my flavor hop, but we are seeing uh, a decrease in the recipes that use flavor hops over time. I think given enough time with this style, we may see this go away altogether and they just be flame out hops, um, similar to what we're seeing with other IPA styles. Aroma hops, we had 12 different aroma hops used. Citric, Cascade, Simcoe, CTZ, Amarillo, and Centennial made up the majority. And surprisingly, I'm not using Citra. I'm gonna use uh, Cascade and Simcoe, and uh, I'll show you in a later slide why. Uh, Whirlpool hops, uh, we're seeing Simcoe, Citra, and Cascade being used, along with some others, uh, the most prominent, and I'll be using uh, Simcoe and Cascade, just to keep the common theme. Um, we are seeing an increase in, in the uh, usage of Simcoe in the Whirlpool uh, over time, as it, as it came onto the scene. Um, I have some theories for this, and I'll explain why Simcoe is becoming much more prominent in this style. Um, Biotransform hops, this, this has only happened recently. Uh, we had eight different ones, Simcoe, HBC472, which is an experimental hop, Citra, Galaxy, Comet, and some others. Um, not a lot of rep recipes use Biotransform, and I won't be in this in my recipe at the end. Uh, Post-fermentation dry hops, um, Citra, Cascade, Simcoe, Amarillo, CTZ, and Chinook made up three quarters of the uh, dry hops used. We had a total of 14. Um, I will be using Simcoe only as my dry hop. And the reason is, when I look at the dry hops, um, I'm showing three here. I'm showing uh, the blue curve is uh, Citra. I'm showing the red curve is Simcoe. And I'm showing the green curve is Cascade. So Cascade and Citra, more citrus forward hops, are, are decreasing in, the, in their usage in these recipes over time, while Simcoe is increasing. And I think... Um, they're trying to get away from the citrusy character of hops and you know Simcoe kind of brings a dank piney um, uh, peachy type um, flavor to a beer flavor and aroma to a beer and I think they're seeing that uh, it pairs well with a roasted the slight amount of roasted flavor you have in this in this style so that's why I've used uh, Simcoe solely as a dry hop and in all my uh, late kettle hop additions we're also seeing Dry hop duration declined from 20-ish 20, 20 days to somewhere between uh, one and five days. This seems to be the norm recently. Um, following the trend that we're seeing in other IPAs with a shorter dry hop at a cooler temperature. 
Um, the rate of hop additions, busy chart, but I'll walk you through it top to bottom. Um, flavor hops is a red curve, so pretty narrow band compared to the others. 68% of the recipes used a flavor hop at an average of 0.27 ounces per gallon or 2 grams per liter. The next is the blue curve, aroma hops. Big range, huge. The order of magnitude difference between the small amount and the large amount used here. 77% of the recipes, a big proportion, used an aroma hop. And an average of 0.36 ounce per gallon or 2.7 grams per liter. Um, the yellow curve is a whirlpool. Uh, again, a pretty big range. Um, order of magnitude from high to low. 55% uh, of the recipes used a whirlpool hop at an average of 0.41 ounces per gallon, which is right here, or th about 3 grams per liter. Um, we only had 18% of the recipes use a biotransform hop at 0.4 ounce per gallon or 3 grams per liter. This is a hop used during active fermentation. And then post-fermentation dry hops, traditional dry hops, um, 0 0.9 or 95% of the recipes used a traditional dry hop um, at an average of 0 0.39 ounce per gallon or 2.92 grams per liter. Again, about an order of magnitude difference between the high and the low. Right here, about 0.4 is the sweet spot for pretty much all these hops. Uh, I plan for my flavor hop addition to be on the low side, 0 0.2. For my aroma, about at the mean, 0 0.4. Um, for my whirlpool, a little high, 0 0.45. And for my, I'm not going to use a biotransform hop. And for my dry hop, I'm going to be very high, 0 0.6 ounces per gallon. And the reason is we're seeing, um, oh, before we get there, Percentages of recipes that use a flavor hop is going down. So we, again, we may see this gone in time. And using a post-fermentation dry hop, uh, that's going up. So more recipes are using a traditional dry hop um, and less are using a, fl a flavor uh, hop addition. And when we look at the total amount of hop mass in the kettle versus the fermenter, we see a, a two big curves with a wide range Average of around 0 0.45 uh, ounces per gallon in the kettle and about 0 0.7 ounces per gallon in the fermenter. Um, I'm going to be higher on, on in the, in the uh, kettle. I'm sorry, that was backwards. 0 0.7 in the kettle and 0 0.45 in the fermenter. I'm going to be at about 1.05 in the kettle. And I'm going to be about 0 0.6. This was the, the Simcoe that I added in, in the fermenter. On the high side, because we're seeing uh, those rates go up. And we see here uh, the total amount of dry hops is going up with time with pretty good correlation coefficient. Uh, total amount of whirlpool hops is going up with time. Again, a good correlation coefficient. Flavor hops, again, going down ounce per gallon over time. The temperature of the whirlpool, again, this is with the latest theories of being around 170. I've seen a lot of the brewlosophy um, stuff on this, and it seems to be a good, a good temperature between 170 and 175 for uh, not uh, summarizing uh, alpha acids too much and retaining some of those essential hop oils. Um, so we are seeing that trend uh, in winning recipes now. For moving on to mashing, 90% uh, of the mashes were infusion, and we had 10% step mash. Uh, we'll be doing a single infusion mash. Um, again, here are those two. We had a pro two protein and one beta. Um, all the sacrification rests. Um, the average temperature was 152 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. <clears throat> that may be wrong. I think that's wrong. I think it's 80 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. I will be on the low side of the mash temperature, and the reason is we're seeing that temperature go down with time. I think we have a bigger beer here that they want more fermentability, which is why they're adding dextrose, and so the mash temperatures are coming down and the mash durations are going up. So they're trying to convert all those dextrins to make it a thick beer. It needs to be very drinkable, and you're seeing that in the mash schedule, reflected in the mash schedules. Bowl duration, anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes, with an average of 69. Um, I'll be at 75. Uh, yeast used, most common was the Chico strain on the majority of the yeast, um, two-thirds almost uh, used that, as well as San Diego. These are very similar flavor profiles. Um, some others used were, this is Northeast Ale, 
uh, which is a Hales Brewery East, uh, the Woodbread Strain, and uh, Kvyking, a Kvike blend. One I, uh, first Kvike I've seen that's won a medal. So, and I'll be using Chico for this. Water chemistry, I won't go through all the ranges, but very big sulfate range. Um, where I'm going to be is right at about 55 for a calcium. I'm not going to add any magnesium. We'll start with RO water, so it won't have magnesium in it. You get magnesium from a lot of your um, yeast nutrient. I don't know if you all knew that, but I tend not to put Epsom salt in my in my beer uh, just because I know there's already magnesium as a yeast nutrient when you add it. So I don't you don't really know what your magnesium is at the end of the day uh, contributed from that yeast nutrient. Um, sodium, I'm going to be um, right at 15. Um, I'll be a little high on the sulfate and a little low on the chloride. And you probably guessed why we're seeing some evolution there as well. So good correlation on the chloride going down and sulfate going up just to get, I think they're getting more of that three to one ratio between sulfates to chlorides for this hoppy beer. Fermentation temperatures were anywhere between 63 and 75 with an average of 67 Fahrenheit or 19 Celsius. Um, the White Labs uh, 001 of the Chico strain was a, a degree lower than the average. Um, I will be a little bit higher than the average, and you guessed it, uh, more evolution on the fermentation temperature. So I think bigger beers, esters need to compete against the, the strong flavors of the hops and the malts, and people are fermenting a little bit warmer. Uh, other variables, the average carbonation volumes was 2.39, and the average pH in the mash was 5.44. Now, moving on to the recipe and just recapping um, American two row pale malt, about 83%. Um, I'm going to use my for my crystal malts, crystal 60 at 4.1, crystal 80 at 1.2. This was wrong in the slide before. Use these numbers, not the ones I provided before. Um, chocolate malt and uh, midnight wheat, 4.1 each, um, and corn sugar at 3%, like I showed before. Uh, for my hop schedule, busy hop schedule, again, this is an IPA, so let's just walk through it. Um, I'm going to bitter with CTZ. Uh, I'm going to put Cascade and Chinook at 15 minutes and at a rate of 0 0.1 ounce per gallon each, or 0 0.74 grams per liter. At the five-minute point, I'm going to put Cascade and Simcoe at 0 0.2 ounce per gallon, or 1.5 grams per liter each. I'm going to do 170-degree uh, Fahrenheit hop stand for 30 minutes with a 0 0.23 ounce per gallon or 1.72 grams per liter each of Cascade and Simcoe. And then I'm going to dry hop a Simcoe for three days at 0 0.6 ounce per gallon or 4.5 grams per liter. This recipe is still evolving. <clears throat> I think it will change in time and Cascade may drop off the radar uh, and be replaced by some other hops. Um, so just watch the space, I guess. Um, but as of today, this is what I'm recommending. For the original gravity, I'm going to shoot for about 1.075 and about 110, 105, 110 IBUs wherever they land with your alpha acids. Um, the water profile, I won't go over it again, but this is it in case you want to snapshot this. Um, mash pH of 5.44, um, which is the mean uh, infusion of uh, 149 Fahrenheit for 80 minutes. Um, mash outs, sorry, that's 80, 75 to 80 minutes. Um, either one will work for that. Uh, mash out sparge and boil for 75 minutes again. Um, I'm going to chill a little bit under the temperature I'm going to ferment at, so about 66 Fahrenheit or 19 Celsius. And I'm going to do a 2 liter starter in a 5 gallon batch. So scale that to whatever size batch you're using. Um, ferment at 68, and when it gets close to the end, uh, raise the temperature a couple degrees to 70 so it finishes out and add the second dry hop addition right before it finishes. You want to capture as much of that hop aroma as you can and not have it, not have the CO2 scrub out the hop aromas. And hold for two to three days. That was the, that was the latest trend for dry hopping. You can try uh, cool dry hopping. I noticed uh, a lot of people are doing that. It wasn't really reflected in the recipes I saw, but there is a trend to um, chill, your chill your beer um, into almost lagering temperatures or somewhere in the 50s and add your, your dry hops there um, and you can retain more of that hop character. Uh, transfer to bottle or keg and carbonate to 2.4 volumes of CO2. 
Okay. The next recipe is again going to be selected from one of my patrons and they've already selected that on Patreon. If you want to contribute to Mean Brews and help uh, sponsor these shows, um, go to my Patreon. It's in the description below and sign up. Uh, the next recipe will be double IPA. It's already been selected and the next four or five have been selected after that. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in the next show. Bye-bye.